Okay, yeah. Um, thanks, Oliver, for pointing out that there was no audio. So sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll begin again. We'll start. Um, yeah. Uh, so before the break, we saw that the house, uh, that the Ark of the Covenant has been placed in the house of Obed Edom, and um, Obed Edom and his entire household they conduct themselves in a very honorable way fearing god uh, you know giving glory to god in everything that they do in their conduct in their choices in their everyday lifestyle and because of the way they are living in such a uh, god fearing manner the lord begins to bless obed edom's household the lord in fact blesses his household to such an extent that david gets to hear about it and that is how we should be living today, you and I, who are containing the Holy Spirit inside us. We literally have the living God living in us. And we should be living the way Obed, Edom and his household lived for those three months. Where everything that they are doing, they are asking themselves, will this please the Lord or not? Is this a righteous thing to do or is it not? What, what would God, what, what action would God want us to take regarding this particular decision? In every single thing they did, they placed the Lord first. This is the fear of the Lord. This is the kind of honorable fear that we should be having towards God. Do we have it? If we do, just as Obed Edom was blessed, the Lord will be able to bless us as well. So when, when David hears that Obed Edom's household is being blessed, now he stops being afraid. He says, oh, look, they are benefiting from all the blessings. If we bring the ark into Jerusalem, then Jerusalem will be blessed. So now he decides, he says, no, no, we, we're going to bring the ark. But this time, we'll do it correctly. So in First Chronicles chapter 15, Verses 12 to 15 is where you have the details. And now in 1 Chronicles 15, 12 to 15, David is so careful. He goes to the Levites. He says to them in verse 12, he says, sanctify yourselves. He says, the Levites are going to be carrying the ark. He says, sanctify yourselves, prepare yourselves. And in verse 13, he says, because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. So he says, the mistake we made the first time, let us not repeat that now. So he tells the Levites, prepare yourselves in the correct manner and correctly find out what the, what the Lord's instructions are. And uh, so the Levites would have you know, consulted Exodus um, you know, the, the earlier passage which we looked at Exodus chapter 25 they would have found out exactly how the ark should be moved so they would have learned all of that prepared themselves spiritually and now the ark is finally brought into Jerusalem in the correct manner maybe we can have one person read out 1st Chronicles chapter 15 verse 15 uh, 1st Chronicles 15 15 and the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. It says here that now this time, um, yeah, uh, the children of the Levites, uh, they, they carry the ark on their shoulders as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. They are very careful now to follow the instructions of God. Do we have that attitude today? We should. Because we have the Holy Spirit living in us. All that we do, it should be as has been commanded according to the word of the Lord. If we are living pleasing lives like that, then the Lord, we know, will be able to release his blessings into our lives. Um, so uh, those were just some of the things that we could look at from the two books of Samuel. Uh, now, due to lack of time, we will move into uh, First Kings and Second Kings. So we will start off by looking at the uh, outline structure of Kings. So the 
um, first kings, we can say that the first 11 chapters can be the first section. So chapters 1 to 11 of first kings, uh, the focus is mainly on Solomon. Um, how did Solomon become king? What were all the events and conspiracies involved in his becoming king? And then uh, after he becomes king, how he built the temple, details about that, all the other building projects which he took up, that's also explained. And then, of course, we also have details about how he falls into uh, sin and he's, you know, starts worshipping other idols and all of that. So all the details of uh, Solomon's life are given in chapters 1 to 11. And then chapters 12 to 22 is basically where you have details about how the uh, kingdom of Israel got divided into northern Israel and southern, uh, southern Judah. So you have the kingdom being split into northern and southern Israel. Okay, So that is discussed in chapters 12 to 22. In the second section, you have a lot of details about Ahab, the evil king. There's also much detail about Elijah, how God, uh, you know, how Elijah goes constantly again and again to Ahab, warns him, corrects him. So um, details about the, some details about the divided kingdom and a lot of details about Ahab's rule and also Elijah's role. These things are described in chapters 12 to 22. Coming to 2 Kings, the structure of 2 Kings, um, the first 17 chapters, uh, we have some details about the divided kingdom. You know, uh, who are the kings ruling in the uh, in uh, the north, the kings who were ruling in the south. Just some details, not much. Uh, but you have a lot of detail about Elisha and the, and the ministry that he did, the miracles that he did. Uh, all those things are given in your uh, first 17 chapters. We also see how finally the northern Israel comes under God's judgment. So, um, you know, most of us will already be familiar with these details. But for uh, the small handful who may not be familiar, once the kingdom gets divided into the northern Israel and southern Israel, um, northern Israel uh, declares Samaria as their capital. Okay? And southern Israel is basically where you have Jerusalem. So Jerusalem becomes the capital of southern Israel and it's usually known as the nation of Judah. So while the term Israel is generally used for northern Israel, the term Judah is used for the southern Israel kingdom so um, and um, what we learn is that the most of the kings of the northern israel don't bother to follow the lord they don't honor god on the other hand in southern israel at least some of the kings uh, choose to stay loyal to the lord and so God declares judgment against northern Israel. He says to the people, if you do not repent, if you don't change your ways, I will bring a powerful army against you and you will be defeated. You will be taken away as slaves from this land and you will you know, have to end up in some foreign country somewhere else. So that is the judgment which is declared against northern, uh, against the northern kingdom. And so in these first 17 chapters, we see how the kings continue to sin against God in northern Israel. The people also, the priests also do not follow the instructions of the Lord until finally we see that the last king of the northern kingdom, Hoshea, a man named Hoshea. He's the last king during whose reign uh, you have the Assyrians coming and they defeat the northern Israelites and they take them away as slaves to Assyria. So that is the end of the northern kingdom. So now uh, only the southern kingdom is left. So in chapters 18 to 25, you have details being given about the southern kingdom. So that would be the structure of your uh, second kings. Um, so let's look at some of the main events which we find in the uh, two books of the kings. Uh, how did 
Solomon come to the throne. In the same way, David's ascension to the throne was not easy. In the same way, there are many complications involved in Solomon coming to the throne. Uh, in Solomon's case, the main uh, opposition is from one of his older brothers. You know, David had many wives. Uh, so uh, all these wives would have had, uh, you know, many sons. But one of the more important sons uh, was somebody <laughs> named Adonijah. So Adonijah has this desire to be king. So in the very first chapter, we see that Adon Adonijah tries to um, hatch a small conspiracy. He takes the support of uh, David's commander, Joab. So along with the support of, Joab's com uh, of, um, of, of Joab, the commander of David, and along with the support of Abiata, the priest, Adonijah establishes himself, announces himself as king. Okay, so, um, however, we learn in chapter 1, 1 Kings chapter 1, that some people choose to remain loyal to, um, to David because David had declared that the actual king should be Solomon because God himself said that Solomon should be the one to come to the throne. So, um, while you have Joab and Abiathar conspiring along with Adonijah to put him on the throne. We have some faithful people who are mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 1, uh, verse um, 6, or was, uh, verse 8, I think, where it says, you know, Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and David's uh, small army unit, you know, his special guard, they remain faithful to, um, to David. So, Nathan comes to uh, Bathsheba and gives a warning saying, see, Adonijah has uh, you know, hatched a conspiracy. He's now going to establish himself as king. Once he establishes himself as king, he's going to you know, kill Solomon, obviously, because you, know, you can't allow uh, your competition to stay alive. So Nathan comes and warns Bathsheba, and he says, you know, the king, is pro king David is probably not even aware that all this is going on, because by that time, King David is very old. He cannot even get up from his bed. He's basically bedridden. So uh, Nathan gives advice to Bathsheba and says, go to the king, tell him what has happened, tell him what Ado Adonijah is planning to do. Otherwise, you and your son will be killed by Adonijah. So Bathsheba goes to the king. She tells him what is happening. And the king says, no, the Lord wanted Solomon to be on the throne. So Solomon should be made king. And so you have these faithful people, Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and uh, you know some of the other faithful uh, followers of David. They all take Solomon to a place called Gihon. And over there, Solomon is anointed as the new king. <laughs> and this is the details that we have in uh, 1 Kings chapter 1, verses... Um, 39 and 40, if someone can read out, 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 39 and 40. Then Jadak the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blow the trumpet and all the people said long live king solomon and all the people went up after him playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy so that the earth was split by their noise okay so it says over here that these faithful followers of david they take solomon to gihon they anoint him as king and then there is a celebration. The trumpets are blown, you know, the people start playing music and uh, it says that the celebration was so loud that the ground shook, is what it says. And while this celebration is going on, there's another celebration going on with, by Adonijah and his party. Adonijah has declared himself as king, so he's having his celebration party in another place. And so he hears the noise which is coming from Gaihon and he says, what is that noise? What's going on over there? 
and so then uh, somebody comes to him and says you know what solomon has been anointed as king and david has now know, knows about the conspiracy so david has given orders for solomon to be anointed as king now you're in big trouble and what does adonijah do he's terrified he goes running to the tabernacle and in the courtyard you have the altar he goes and he cl clutches hold of the horns of the altar you now the uh, the altar had um, had i don't know maybe you can call it poles you know at uh, on the four corners of the altar the four corners of the altar you would have four poles they here they called the horns the horns of the altar because they are shaped like a horn um so if anyone holds on to that it's like symbolically saying i am crying out to the lord for mercy may my life be spared so adonijah goes running into the courtyard and he cl clutches hold of the horns um and then because he is crying out for mercy solomon chooses to show mercy and this is what solomon says um in uh yeah we're still in chapter 1 and then if you were to look at uh verse 40 um 49 50 there onwards um and then when you come to verse 52 is where solomon says if he shows himself to be worthy not a hair of his head will fall to the ground but if evil is found in him he will die so solomon behaves honorably he does not kill adonijah because adonijah has gone over there and is clutching on to the horns crying out for mercy um, um solomon says all right if he continues to behave himself if he does not you know try to create any problem for my throne let him live i will allow him to live but if he tries to do any conspiracy once again he will be killed and we see adonija showing his true colors he is not grateful for the mercy which solomon has shown and so he comes up with another tactic and we see that in chapter 2 so a lot of details were involved you know in david becoming king solomon becoming king it was not it's not just a simple procedure where you know the, the person just went and sat on the throne a lot of events were involved so uh, in chapter 2 uh, we see adonija going to bathsheba and he says you know i am so i am one of the older sons i am the one who should have been on the throne but then it's okay i mean you know david wanted uh, uh, solomon to be on the throne so fine i lost the throne but you know one small favor at least can i have you know the 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 concubine whom david married in his old age abishag the shunamite can i have her as as my wife is what uh, is the request that um, adonija goes and makes to bathsheba and bathsheba very innocently goes to her son and says you know poor adonija he's asking for one request he's saying you know can we have give the concubine uh, you know who who used to be the concubine of david can we give him to uh can we give her to adonija and king solomon says to his mother in verse 22 he says uh, if we give the concubine to him it's like a declaration saying fine you take over the kingship you know it's such a very foolish thing to say so that's exactly what he says he says why do you request abishag the shunamite for adonija you might as well request the kingdom for him after all he is my older brother and so you know king solomon is very upset with this tactic which um which adonija has come up with and so um now what does adonija do this time last time he went running into the courtyard and he caught hold of the altar now what does he do he actually goes into the holy place you know the tabernacle has got two sections you have the holy place and the most holy place so we see him this time he goes into the holy place and the altar which is over there he goes and clutches on to that and again he is hoping that there will be mercy shown to him but now you know there's no mercy shown to him in fact you know benaya the priest is given instruction go inside go inside the holy place kill the man exactly you know right where he is kill him because he has again and again tried to conspire against god's appointed king and so we see that you know um, adonija is uh, killed so we see the um, treachery of this adonija 
and solomon is very honorable in his uh, first few years uh, so we see that i mean we are we are very familiar with that story you know if um, that would be in your first kings chapter 3 uh, when solomon is appointed as king he is so grateful to the lord for giving such a great responsibility to somebody who is so small and ordinary like him you know he understands the magnitude of the privilege which is being given to him and so he uses all these words uh, in in fact it says in verse 4 you know first kings chapter 3 verse 4 it says that he was so grateful that he offers a thousand burnt offerings you know on the altar at gibeon he is that humbled by what the lord has done for him and he says you know in verse 7 he says i am only a little child and i do not know how to carry out my duties and so he says in verse 9 he asks the lord and he says lord you give me a discerning heart so that i will be able to govern your people in the right way you know this is the wording that he uses over there in verse 9 uh first kings chapter 3 verse 9 he says for who is able to govern this great people of yours he doesn't say they are my people he says lord i know that these israelites are your people and i have to govern them lord i want to do it in a proper way in an honorable way you give me discernment of heart or oh lord so that i will be able to lead these people in the correct manner now that should be the attitude of christian leaders today you know we have uh, uh, mega pastors mega preachers and they say my people they'll say you know but actually the congregation is not their people the congregation is the lord's people their responsibility is just to govern these people lead them you know mentor them teach them the ways of god show them you know how to disciple others that's all they they are meant to be more like a supervisor and a teacher not really a king so a christian leader must always be aware that the people whom they are ministering to they are god's people not their people not their personal property to be you know controlled and ruled so uh, that should be the correct attitude um so the lord is very pleased with uh, solomon's humble attitude and so the lord says in verse 12 yes i will give you a wise and discerning heart and then uh, in the next verse the lord also says even though you did not ask me for wealth and honor i will give you those things as well and this is how solomon starts off his kingship but then later after his death when rehoboam is getting ready to climb on the throne what do the people come and say to rehoboam they say your father solomon put so many taxes on us that we could not even bear the weight of it will you show more mercy will you reduce the taxes so that you know we will be able to support our households so what happened to this man who said lord i have to govern your people give me a discerning heart so that i know i'm able to lead them in the correct manner what happened to him somewhere along the way he began to put such heavy taxes on them that the people could not even bear it what happened it was a slow gradual backsliding he takes 7 years to build the temple of the lord and then how many years does it take to build his own temple his own palace anybody remembers he spends 13 years almost double what he spent on building the temple of the lord he takes 7 years to build the temple of the lord he takes 13 years to build himself a grand palace and he builds one palace for the pharaoh's daughter because he has gone and married the pharaoh's daughter what did the lord say the lord said when you marry you should marry from uh, you know the people of israel not outsiders not idol worshipers but why what does this man have, what has he done is already gone and worship um, gone and um, um, married a, a a pagan princess why does he do that because that's basically what all the kings are doing around him the nations you know the kings they establish a political partnership a political alliance with the other nation by marrying their 
uh, you know into their families so in this way solomon marries a series of different princesses from different nations basically he is forging partnerships with them nowadays when we have international uh, treaties we just have signing of papers no marriages thankfully but in those days if you wanted to establish uh, you know an international uh, relation with another nation you there would be a marriage alliance involved so this man is doing it for political reasons where is the need for him to do this the lord has said the throne is yours your kingdom is safe nobody will even attack he's given that promise that his will be a reign of peace there will be no war during his uh, lifetime uh, this is in first chronicles chapter 22 verse 9 the lord promises him that he will have peace on every side he doesn't have to worry about being attacked by any of the enemies so where is the need for him to go and establish his international alliances somewhere along the way he stopped trusting the lord he thought if i can build up my position if i can make myself secure if i can have partnership with all these people then nobody will fight against me from from a man who trusted the lord now he's fallen into this mode of making one political alliance after another to get the favor of humans so instead of building this international relations if he had instead built his relationship with the lord and made that strong and secure that would have benefited both him and the nation and the same lesson can even apply to us you know are we so desperate to win the favor of people are we so eager to you know to get the uh, contact of the influential people in ministry circles and you know make friends with them because if you have good connections then you can rise up and do more things for the lord you know is that the attitude rather than building our relationship with people uh, you know with the idea of promoting ourselves if we can just confine ourselves to strengthening the vertical relationship with the lord he will take care of the ministry you don't need powerful contacts you don't need you know powerful contributors who can you know pour a lot of money into your ministry you don't need the horizontal partnerships what you actually need is that vertical partnership if that is strong and secure the funds will come when the funds have to come when 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 when, when the lord you know when you, when you need a new opening into a new place you will get the opening irrespective of whether people are backing you up or not because that partnership is strong and secure so we see um, you know solomon has fallen away is is done all these you know he's gotten into all these political alliances and gradually obviously you know to please them he would have also started participating in their pujas and that is how he ends up in complete idol worship now another thing that we learn is that he builds all kinds of expensive gardens in jerusalem which would have cost a lot of money and then it says that he purchased many many expensive arabian horses now what is god told him there is not going to be any warfare during his reign so why is he buying those expensive arabian horses not because there's going to be any war just status symbol you know, like people nowadays they collect cars right so he wanted to collect horses just for status he is not even going to have to fight any battles god is going to take care of him but this man is making a collection of horses and who's paying for all of these fancy things the people they are being taxed very very heavily so that he can collect the funds to do all these things to promote himself and this is the man who said in the beginning lord they are your people i want to govern them in a way which is correct you help me how far he has fallen how very far he has fallen now he's no longer leading those people nor shepherding them in fact those poor people they say your father was so harsh will you at least show us some kindness is what they ask rehoboam so solomon is a complete um, disgrace uh, to the name of the lord he is not the kind of king that you know the lord had wanted him to be originally so we see the insecurity of solomon and then we see that same insecurity also in jeroboam so after solomon's death 
Rehoboam, his son, is supposed to come to the throne. Um, but uh, the Lord is very displeased with the behavior of Solomon. And so the Lord says, only Judah and um, Benjamin will remain you know, under the Davidic lineage. The other 10 tribes will be given to somebody else. And so in 1 Kings chapter 11 is where you have the story about the rise of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was basically a official working for Solomon. When Solomon sees how talented Jeroboam is, he decides to appoint him as one of um, as, as the in charge of one of his labor forces. You know, Solomon had a lot of labor forces because he was he had, he had, he had all these fancy building projects. So he had a lot of labor forces. And so one of the officers in charge of one of the labor forces was Jeroboam. And God decides to choose that official to be the king of the 10 tribes. It's a great honor that the Lord is planning on bestowing upon this man. And so one day when Jeroboam is going someplace, you know, is, um, is going out of Jerusalem to another place, on the way, uh, in chapter 11, we see this first Kings chapter 11. Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh, comes to him. And Ahijah, the prophet, tells him, God is going to take away 10 tribes from the Davidic lineage and he will be giving it to you. And God makes very, very lavish promises to Jeroboam. This is what the Lord says to him in uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 37, 38, 39. So if we can have someone read out for us, 1 Kings chapter 11, 37, 38, 39. And I will take, take Dijas and you shall be king over Israel. And if you will listen to all that I command you and will work in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my status and my commandments as David my servant did, did I will be with you and will build you a certain house as I build for David and I will give Israel to you and I will afflict the offspring of David because of this but not a for forever. Okay. All right. So here the Lord is promising Jeroboam and saying you know, I'm going to give you 10 tribes. You're going to become the ruler of those. Under your Rehoboam, only two tribes will be there. And this is what God says to him in verse 37. He says, you will rule over all that your heart desires. How much of a territory you want, I will help you to conquer it. You will, I will bless you. And the Lord says to him in verse 38, I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David. In no way will you be inferior. Whatever privileges the Davidic lineage has, the same privileges will be given even to you. This is the beautiful promise that the Lord makes to Jeroboam. But then when Jeroboam comes to the throne, what does he think in his foolish, foolish heart? He tells himself, oh, okay, 10 tribes have now come to me. But all these people, every year, they'll be going for, for a number of festivals to Jerusalem. Every time they go to Jerusalem, what if somebody brainwashes them? You know, what if they decide to go back uh, and make the Davidic, Davidic king, you know, their ruler? What if they go away from me? Insecurity. In spite of the lavish promises that God makes to him. And so he decides, oh, no, no, no. No, let me build two, uh, to make two golden calves. And let them, you know, consider these two golden calves as the symbols of Yahweh. So instead of going over there and worshipping Yahweh in Jerusalem, no, they will just worship these two calves because these two calves are symbolizing Yahweh. Now, this again is a cultural kind of a thing. Um, something easier for us in India to understand. Uh, we have all these, uh, you know, um, 
gods and goddesses belonging to the other religions. And if you notice all these gods and goddesses, they'll have a transport. You know, you have one, uh, one, one um, god, demon goddess which sits on a tiger. And then you have another god which, you know, sits on another animal. So like that. Uh, so the tiger is a symbol of the of that particular demon goddess, you know, that kind of a thing. So in the same way, Jer uh, this uh, Jeroboam, he makes two golden calves. He's not telling them to worship the calves. Basically, he's saying, you know, they are like a symbol of Yahweh. So when you're worshiping them, it's like as if you're worshiping Yahweh. And because none of the actual Levite priests will support something like this, he actually goes ahead and he appoints um, priests from other tribes because you know the Levites will definitely not participate in something rotten like this. So we see in um, which chapter would that be? Chapter 12. First Kings chapter 12, uh, we see in verse 31, he appoints priests uh, for this you know new, new temple which he has constructed. So he puts one calf in Bethel, the other calf he puts it in Dan. So those two places become places of heathen worship. And he appoints priests who you know who will be able to do the ceremonies over there. And in fact, he makes a similar kind of festival so that the people will not go to Jerusalem for the actual festival. They will celebrate the alternate festival over here. In he gets into all this idolatry simply because he doesn't believe that God will give him the dynasty which God promised. He doesn't trust in the living God. So we see Solomon displaying great insecurity, getting into political alliances, getting into greed. And we see Jeroboam doing the same mistake. He's so scared that the people will go away from him that he starts idol worship. I mean, imagine idol worship was not there. He introduced it. What a terrible thing to do. What an evil thing to do when God so lovingly told him the same kind of dynasty that the that Davidic lineage has, I will give you the same kind of dynasty. And the man doesn't even trust God. And then, um, you know, coming to Rehoboam, again, same story. You know, the, the friends and companions of Rehoboam tell him, no, 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 don't show kindness to the people. If you start reducing the taxes, you know, they may take you lightly. On the other hand, tell them, I'll be even more harsh than my father. Again, insecurity. Out of insecurity, Rehoboam, you know, uh, takes the advice of his friends and he says, I will be harsh over you. I will rule over you. And the people say, we're not interested in you being our king. We'll go find out a different king. And which is basically how they end up under Jeroboam. Um, another thing that we see, Solomon actually tries to murder Jeroboam. I mean, uh, all his life, you know, uh, Saul was trying to kill David. And now we see this Solomon doing the same thing to Jeroboam. He tries to kill him and Jeroboam runs away, hides in Egypt. And only after the death of Solomon, he comes back so that he can become king of the uh, 12 tribes. So where is the faith? Where is the trust in God? We don't see it happening in these chapters. So we need to ask ourselves, am I walking differently from these people? Am I so insecure? Am I so afraid of whether you know my ministry will grow or not? Whether the Lord will uh, lift me up and glorify me or not? You know, are these our concerns? If we are like that, then we will end up taking wrong steps, just like Rehoboam, Solomon, Jeroboam. You know, let us not be one of those oams. Let us be different. Let us be people who will, you know, um, take a stand and say, what the Lord has spoken, he will do. I choose to trust him. I will not compromise. I will not fall into sin. I will stand on the word of the Lord and choose to obey him in his time. In his way, he will give me whatever position he wants me to have. You know, so that should be our attitude. We must not have the kind of insecurity which we see in the lives of these rotten uh, kings. All right. So um, we don't really have much time. Uh, maybe we can very briefly look at Elisha and Elijah because, you know, they too are a very important uh, part of uh, the book of Kings. So um, Elijah, of course, is mentioned in First Kings, and you know Elisha is mainly mentioned in Second Kings. And um, 
it's basically because of elijah that at least some level of holiness continues you know in uh, northern israel during the days of ahab ahab if you remember that man uh, he completely goes into idolatry and sin and he in fact encourages all the people of his land to get into idolatry so during that time elijah plays a very important role he is the one who you know goes from town to town uh, teaching about the things of god so because of elijah's efforts you know we see that uh, the, the the true worship of yahweh continues only because of this of the work which is being done by this uh, great prophet and uh, of course one of the important events that we see regarding elijah is uh, you know the contest which happens between the prophets of baal and the living god on mount carmel so um, during that incident he clearly proves and establishes that all these idols you know which these kings are encouraging the people to worship those are nothing compared to the living god and the living god establishes his superiority so we see those details about elijah elisha one of the important uh, miracles that i remembered about elisha is the uh, healing of naaman um so we see that in the case of both elijah and elisha you have one miracle of multiplication um in elijah's case it is basically with the widow of zarephath um you know if someone could please give me some water because um, the throat is like getting really dry thanks a lot now most of us are familiar with the you know the story of the widow of zarephath so we'll not really get into the details of it uh, but then we see that in first kings chapter 17 um so in first kings chapter 17 the the you know the flour with which this lady was supposed to make the last bit of bread um that continues to multiply the supply of the bread does not run out so uh, that is the miracle of multiplication that we see uh, in the case of elisha elisha also has something similar uh, that would be in your second kings chapter 4 so in second kings chapter 4 uh, we have one of the prophets who dies and is uh, so now financially the that family is in a bad state and so um, because they are unable to repay their debts the debtors come and take away the two the, the debtors want to come and take away the two sons as slaves so this lady comes to elisha and she says you know i am part of the my husband was one of the prophets and now he is dead please help us financially so that you know my sons will not be taken away as slaves and so um, this is in second kings chapter 4 where we see elisha telling you know collect empty jars from all the other houses start pouring whatever oil you have left into these jars and we see that the oil multiplies so we have a multiplication um, miracle uh, done by elijah we also see a miracle of multiplication being done by uh, elisha in the same way elijah brings a child back to life elisha also brings a child back to life in the case of elijah uh, that's basically the family which was providing him bread you know so the that widow's son dies and when the when the when the widow's son dies um we have elijah all that is will, will be in chapter 17 elijah he stretches himself out on the dead boy three times and then the boy comes back to life in the case of, case of elisha uh, it's it, it has to do with the uh, lady from uh, shunem so you know that lady uh, from shunem she they they construct a, a room on top of their house where he can come and stay 
and so in return he blesses them and says you will have a child and then that little boy when he dies uh, you have elisha doing something similar he spreads himself out he stretches himself out on the child two times in uh, yeah the first time when he stretches himself on the, on the child um that would be in your chapter second kings chapter 4 yeah second kings chapter 4 itself um somewhere around the end of the chapter uh verse 36 37 somewhere over there um so uh, the first time he stretches himself out on the dead boy the boy the boy's body begins to grow warm and then the second time when he stretches himself out on that boy the child comes back to uh, life so uh, the ministry and the miracles of elisha and elijah are very similar we see a lot of similarities uh, between these two prophets uh, the um, uh, yeah oh there is a lot to be said about ahab and all the conspiracies you know nowadays we see this um, tv series of dynasties they say you know i mean these large families and then uh, all kinds of conspiracies happen in these families and somebody wants to take power and and all that they could actually make a tv series out of ahab's uh, you know dynasty really i mean the number of conspiracies and sub conspiracies which take place you know ahab his wife the things which she does and then uh, Uh, the things which are uh, you know done through the descendants lot of conspiracies take place during this uh, ahab's thing you can actually make a tv series out of it and people will watch because the story is quite interesting all kinds of things happen and elijah is the one who plays the main role again and again he goes to the king he warns him he gives uh, you know words of judgment to him and uh, so there's absolutely no time to get into all of that um, but you know um, we were able to look at at least some of the main details about david and solomon uh, so no one has posted any questions in the chat uh, if anyone has any questions over here you can you can raise a hand otherwise we'll close with a word of prayer any questions there are no questions but people were you know paying attention and listening so i'm quite happy yeah so uh, let's close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for all the life lessons that we could learn oh lord uh, from your word today lord we want to learn from the positive examples and we want to avoid the wrong conduct oh lord of the negative examples that were presented today please oh lord help us to become people who will honor you who will trust you who will trust you enough to hold on to you instead of running after position of power oh lord make us into that kind of a people help us a oh lot to be like david who did not go running and sit on the throne the minute he got a chance instead he waited for you he waited to hear from you he wanted to be guided by you for him righteousness was more important than getting the throne so lord help us to have that kind of an attitude where our heart's desire is to please you rather than get position lord you 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 do that oh lord that work inside us if we have anything of any 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 rottenness inside us oh lord the kind of rottenness that um, that solomon did that jeroboam had that rehoboam displayed lord if that kind of a rottenness is inside us oh lord pluck it out from the roots oh lord lord do a work of discipline and correction in us because now oh lord um uh, the students are still at their study stage tomorrow oh lord they are going to be in leadership positions and ministry positions so oh lord do a work of great deep sanctification inside them right now lord if there is any rottenness inside pluck it out now oh lord any greed and lust for power pluck it out now oh lord help us a oh lot to sanctify ourselves and refine ourselves now so that tomorrow when responsibility is placed on our shoulders we will be like david o oh lord and not like jeroboam o oh lord help us o oh lord to live lives that honor you help us o oh lord to be like obed edom and his household so that 
when you live inside us oh lord we will honor you and glorify you in all that we do oh lord so we pray that you would help us to develop that kind of an attitude we commit ourselves lord into your hands thank you lord in jesus name amen amen